At the end of the piece, several of the writers of Thomas Brown, describing the practice in Holland, quote, in a home where there'd been a death, to drape black mourning ribbons over all the mirrors and all canvases depicting landscape or people or fruits of the field, so that the soul, as it left the body, would not be distracted on its final journey, either by a reflection of itself or by a last glimpse of the land now being lost. These would be bleak choices for a writer if they were the only ones. The landscape screened in impassive black, or seen as a reflection of the self, or as a glimpse of a land of lost content. All these are common cliches in writing about landscape and nature. We all find it hard to wrap right without seeing nature as hewed by our own emotions. And I freely admit that those of us who are drawn by the more creative, regenerative thread in nature are guilt, as guilty as several of another colour of drape, of Tyrian purple or the colour of optimism. But I stress the work, again, the writer's work, of finding a common ground between truth to one's imaginative view of nature and all of our imaginative views of nature, because that's the way that humans are programmed to look at the world, and truth to the world beyond the self. John Clare was the writer for the Flatlands. Um, he once went as far as to write a piece assuming the voice of a piece of land called The Lament of Swardy Well. And it's a very powerful piece and oddly doesn't ever become embarrassing or clunky. But I think it's these more subtle devices of respect um, that are significant in, in, uh, as lessons about how one begins to write about nature and empathy, as it were, from the inside. I think, for instance, uh, 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 the wonderful way um, he, he spills um, experience it's as exuberantly as line coming off a fishing reel. A, a typical poem is, I, and I remembered something. While, where the blackberries hung like whatever, while this bird was singing. There's no hierarchy of features, not even sometimes a point of view. And Seamus Heaney called uh, this uh, the one thing after the otherness of the world. But in Clare, it's also about the interconnectedness of time and place in nature. In his sequence of poems on birds' nests, Clare achieves a state of what I would call solidarity with the birds, a sense of being fellow commoners with them. In his wonderful poem, To the Snipe, um, the landscape is described in, in Clare's patois, full of the most touchy-feely words about uh, bog moss and, and, and water but they're expanded in the poem to the scale of a huge rainforest as they are experienced by the bird. Common ground again. Gary Snyder, in his deliciously subversive essay, Unnatural Writing, suggests that writers should attempt the exercise of seeing and attempting to write not bounded by the human front-mounted eye. Um, almost every creature on the planet except us and a few owls and has eyes, to some degree, round the side of their heads. And Snyder said, what a challenge that would be, to try and look for a moment through eyes like that. I'll finish something which I, I did for this little occasion, which, which was uh, Snyderian in one sense. And I, 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 I tried to um, look through, in, in a rather odd way um, at this flat, wet, wasted region where we're gathered. Um, the coastal marshes, especially, which is what so horrified Claire and Sebel, and which are also on the front line of climate change from inundation. And it may be that unless we change our way of seeing them, they are going to be experienced as even more of a wasteland, because we fail to see um, the intricacy and detail of what is truly happening to them. So I've taken a, 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 a leaf from Aldo Leopold, um, and these are, uh, is a short program for thinking like a marsh. It seems at the first glance to be a negation of landscape. Nothing blocks the view to the horizon. There are no elevations, no shadows, no points of uncertainty. But think of it for a moment as a landscape whose contours are under the ground, as an inverted habitat riddled with concavities. Then imagine it turned upside down. The prospect is suddenly rumpled with mounds and reticulations. Glacial hollows and human peat pits swell like prehistoric barrows. Dikes are three-dimensional fences. 
peat layers appear and disappear in complex laminations. <coughs> now turn it the right way up again. Think of the whole surface of the marsh as an outgrowth of this damp labyrinth. Resist the pull of the horizon and shorten your focus. The homogeneity vanishes. There are dark sedges, livid bog mosses, lustrous mist green patches of reeds. There are grass tussocks, scrubby tumps, flashes, pools, inscrutable ribbons of vegetation. Close your focus, focus further, and you realize that this apparently bland and static view is in constant motion. Marshes, mosaics of thin verticals, are animated by the wind like no other landscape. Now think of the birds that coast above marshlands as dowsers of this complex geometry of wetland and wind. Duck explode into the air, manifesting patches of water that to the watcher are quite invisible. Marsh harriers pack across the fens, rising and falling as they ride invisible currents in the air, pockets of low pressure, tiny thermals generated by the minute shifts from water to grass to reed. Once in Suffolk, I watched a hobby falcon gliding through, the, gliding through the troughs in a reed bed like a surfer. Hobbies, too, resist the stereotypes like the fens as they hunt over the, hunt over the fens, respecting their habitat's capriciousness. They are faster and more agile than peregrines over level ground and can take swifts in the autumn. Yet on the damp days of spring, there is a truce between the two species. The predator gliding close to the surface of the water catching gnats alongside the swifts. Another barely noticed ripple on the flatness of the marsh. <laughs>